Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor uh, Miyase Christensen. Also, uh, if I may love the personal remark, I'm very happy to have a dear friend with us today. Um, Miyase obtained her PhD uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. It was in 2003. 2003, and then uh, she uh, moved to Istanbul to work at uh, Bahçeşehir University. She taught there, and she also served as a chair uh, of film and television for over uh, two years. And then she moved to uh, Karlstad University, Sweden. And uh, she uh, she's still a professor of uh, media and communication uh, department uh, at Karlstad University, but also she works as a researcher uh, in Stockholm for the uh, Royal Institute of uh, technology uh, in the Department of Philosophy and History of Technology. Um, it's impossible not to be impressed by her uh, publications. Uh, she already has published four books and uh, there are four more forthcoming as far as I can see. Uh, let me cite them in order to give you an idea about uh, her interests. Uh, some of them are uh, from Mel Grave Macmillan, uh, forthcoming Cosmopolitanism and the Media, the Cartography of Change. From Rutledge, a co-edited collection of essays, Understanding Media and Culture in Turkey, Structures, Spaces, Voices. From Peter Lang Publishing, Media, Surveillance and Identity, a Social Perspective. Again from Palgrave Macmillan, Another co-edited book, When the Ice Breaks, Media and the Science and Politics of Climate Change. She has dozens of papers published in refereed journals or in edited books, papers given at conferences. Um, and a quick glance reveals some major key words, uh, cosmopolitanism, surveillance, networked communities, European media landscapes, gendered perspectives, Diaspora, Turkish diaspora, European Union, information society, politics, and I think climate change is becoming a major concern for her uh, these days. Um, we are very fortunate that uh, we are uh, we're going to uh, listen to a brand new talk, uh, which has not been published yet, uh, Intervalience, Complicit Surveillance and the Question of Cosmopolitanism towards the phenomenological <laughs> understanding of mediatization. Miyase Christensen. Thank you. Well, Nizi, thank you very much for this very generous and embarrassing <laughs> introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. And thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to come here, visit your university, and uh, share some of my research results with you today. So thank you. Oops. Well, what I will talk about today is based on two recent works, two recent papers. One is entitled Intervalence, Complicit Surveillance and the Question of Cosmopolitanism Towards a Phenomenological Understanding of Mediatization. And this is a paper uh, that is accepted to the ICA conference that is going to be held in um, Phoenix in May this year. And it's also under review at a journal at the moment. But I will also talk about another uh, paper, another article, which was recently published, Online Mediations in Transnational Spaces, Cosmopolitan Reformations of Belonging and Identity in the Turkish Diaspora. And the reason why I wanted to talk about these two papers together and some of the conceptual tropes that run through both papers has to do with the fact that both works in a number of um, other works that I'm working on at the moment are the product of, are associated with three uh, projects. And one of these projects, which is, come to com which is coming to a completion this year, is entitled Secure Spaces, Media Consumption and Social Surveillance. And this is a project, a four-year project funded by the Central Bank of Sweden, 
I guess Sweden is one of those rare countries where the central bank dedicates um, a generous amount of um, funding for purely academically oriented research. And what I am and my research partner are looking at in this project is the new emergences or new conceptions, new conceptualizations, new appropriations of surveillance, which is a term we classically, traditionally associate with institutional practice, which is top-down, either conducted by the state or the military or other larger entities. But like everything else in society, surveillance is also one of those things that is socially evolving, being negotiated and renegotiated, and we are seeing new emergences, new understandings of surveillance, new meanings attached to it, and new practices. And the aim of this project was to look at how surveillance operates at the subjective level. Because so far, surveillance has been studied, if you remember studies by Foucault or Anthony Giddens's, um talk about surveillance as uh, one of the two tenets of modernity with bureaucracy and surveillance. We are seeing a lot of the literature about surveillance has to do with its top-down nature at the macro level, at the rhetorical level. But what we're seeing with increased use of media technologies, media and communication technologies, is that surveillance is being adopted in novel ways at the subjective level as well. As I will talk about later, for example, we're seeing that surveillance, peer-to-peer -peer surveillance, for example, through online social media, is being appropriated as a socialization tool. So in short, we are seeing some new meanings uh, attached to surveillance and new practices of surveillance, and that was the logic behind this project, to look at it. Um, at the subjective individual level. And I will say more about it as, as I go along. And the other two projects, which are, which we could say, sister projects or projects associated with um, this one, which are starting this year, are uh, one is entitled Cosmopolitanism from the Margins, Mediations of Expressivity, Social Space, and Cultural Citizenship. And in this project, I'm looking at how, I'm looking at three marginalized groups one is um, urban explorers and urban explorations movements. The other is street art and street artists. And the third one is um, sexually marginalized groups of non-commercial sort. And I'm looking at how politics and identity materializes around certain communicative practices and their use of media and mediation. And the other project is called Kinetic Elites, the Mediatization of Social Belonging and Close Relationships Among Mobile Class Fractions. And this is looking at a certain fraction of global mobile group of people and their use of um, media, media tools and their uh, communicative practices. So what's common to all of these projects is, um, uh, of course, one is mediatization, the concept of media, mediatization that runs through all three projects. And the second one has to do with cosmopolitanism, that is, looking at these uh, novel forms, some of novels, some are sort of inherited from before, so there's continuity as well, communicative practices, and to see the kinds of openings and ruptures that occur in the social sphere. In some ways, due to the fact that we are using media and communication technologies uh, more and more in everyday life, in institutional life, in every aspect of life, we are seeing more interconnectedness and we are seeing more what we could call cosmopolitan openings and interconnection, but at the same time we are seeing more and more compartmentalization and encapsulation as well. So there are some um, dual dynamics at play. And in, in short, in a nutshell, these are some of the ideas behind these uh, projects. And it's to say a few words, to, a few more words about um, where I'm coming from, so to speak, before I start talking about these two particular papers, some of the departure points or underlying logics that mark these projects and the papers and, and, and the rest of what I'm trying to um, do at the moment, is one, a humble effort to produce a critique of some veins of media studies, or what came to be labeled as internet studies. That we have seen especially the last decade and a half or two decades and what I see is the problematic dichotomization of old and new media, that is this techno-deterministic understanding of media, especially of new technologies. And we, see, we saw a lot of research, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, about how new media technologies are liberating, emancipating. But we are also seeing more and more examples of research which talk about 
we're not only seeing change, but we're also seeing continuity and pointing to the fact that we need to regard these media technologies in a less uh, techno-deterministic way. And again, the celebratory attitude toward, again, in some veins of media communication studies um, is, an, is two domains creating a disjuncture that is the real and the virtual or the online and the offline. As Vincent Mosco wrote in 2004 in a book uh, called The Digital Sublime, when technologies cease to be sublime and enter the realm of the banal, they become significant sources for social and economic change. And I think we are pretty much seeing that at the, at the current stage. The old enchantment with technology is fading away and media technologies are becoming more and more part of um, everyday life in more banal ways. And I think we are more realistically perhaps seeing um, uh, what is happening with these technologies in, in social life, individual life, and institutional life. And there are three aspects that I seek to foreground um, to understand social, political, and individual appropriations of media and communication tools. Um, one is the need to see technology use as part of the totality of social practice, not in isolation from the rest of social practice. Um, and that's why in, in all three of the projects, I'm also trying to include spatial dimensions, city space, and how we can think about media use in relation to those offline, so to speak, or, or real um, elements and dynamics. And second, to see mediation not necessarily as eliminating power. It is very much enmeshed uh, with gender inequality and material and cultural capital but it's certainly factoring into power relations. So it, is, it, it does happen to be the case that sometimes we see um, emancipation and new playing fields in relation to class relations or gender, but sometimes we also see very much closure and dependency. And on this point, I would like to refer to the recent work of uh, two colleagues, Mirka Madina and Daniel Miller, who did a study, a long-term study um, on Filipino women who work as nannies in the United Kingdom. And they interviewed over 150 such women and they also went to the Philippines to talk to their families. And what they found was that even though these women take on traditionally male role of breadwinners, and even though technology use offers interesting new practices of distance mothering, they also found that gender roles are far from being leveled due to the feminization of migration. And they write, Transnational mothering, made increasingly prevalent due to the feminization of migration, is often considered one of the hidden injuries of globalization. What has changed since the intensification of research on transnational families over the past 15 years is the explosion of opportunities for cheap communication. And in her study of Filipino left behind children, Parenas noted that when mothers migrate, they are expected to perform both the caring and emotional work typically associated with their maternal role, but also take on the traditional uh, role of uh, breadwinning. And they write in their book that when they interviewed these women, it was very much the case with a lot of them that they introduced them to their computers as well, because the, the home and their connection with the home became embodied very much with their relationship with the computer and their need to be um, online all the time to connect with their uh, children through Skype. And that was a very interesting study. This is just to exemplify that even though it can be emancipating in some contexts, it's also, it, it is very much um, reproducing old dynamics. And finally, uh, the need to pose research questions as social questions and positioning media and communication alongside social, economic, cultural, and political factors and actors. In other words, not simply as media questions or technology questions, again, to avoid uh, technological determinism or seeing media use and technology use in isolation, independent from other, other factors. Um, to go back to the first project, Secure Spaces, Media Surveillance and, and, and Consumption, to say a little more about that project and what I will talk about in relation to complicit surveillance, interveillance uh, and mediatization today, the standpoint behind that project, or the departure point, is that given that socio-political and personal life are increasingly structured by and structuring the use of media, and particularly of everyday communication technologies, such as mobile applications or online social media, 
then some of the questions that emerge are how do people negotiate the ambivalence between freedom, flexibility and connectivity on the one hand that come with increased media use, um, especially these uh, mobile technologies and online technologies, and social control and capsularization, which also come with media and technology use. And how are various modes of communication and mediation patterns and experiences related to, or how can we think about these in relation to overarching or macro structures and questions in, in our contemporary societies, such as cosmopolitanism, citizenship and civic practice, uh, citizenship practices and community building and related questions. And as I said, we are looking at it at the individual level, at the subjective level. And the project, the data sources for the project come from one, qualitative interviews, and as I will talk about in a minute, a quantitative nationwide survey. And the qualitative interviews were conducted with um, different segments of the society, uh, of, of Swedish society. For example, with individuals with my <coughs> backgrounds, the interviews I conducted living in the Stockholm urban area, people of Turkish and Kurdish origin but originating from Turkey who came to um, Sweden for various purposes, individuals with varied back backgrounds, both native Swedes and migrants living in small town settings in Sweden, those who live in the central areas of Stockholm with a good level of access to economic and cultural capital, it is middle class and upper middle class segments, and Swedish development workers who uh, live and work in South America. And the survey was conducted um, using the Gothenburg University's annual survey called Society Opinion and Media in 2009. Therefore, we got a quantitative um, data as well, which is representative of um, the Swedish uh, national profile. So these were the data sources that we primarily used in this project. And the purpose um, is twofold. To address surveillance is a collective and individual practice, both at its broader abstract level, which is to be able to produce some theorization as to how can we think about surveillance and this emergence of new understandings, new meanings, new practices attached to surveillance, and to discuss it in the light of its specific manifestations, that is, how do people deal with this, or what forms, what shapes it takes in the everyday life, in the lives of individuals in relation to their uh, mediation habits and practices, in relation to their media use. One clear result that we saw, just trying to sum up some of the findings here in a nutshell, uh, from the qualitative part of the study in particular, was that the ever more complex entanglement of daily social and personal practice, technology use, and increased mobility, both, both imaginative and real mobility, uh, imaginative in the sense of um, the mediated uh, mobility, it makes it very difficult to differentiate between the various levels of surveillance assemblage. That is, as I said before, surveillance classically was conceptualized as a top-down institutional practice, but we are seeing a lot of different dynamics due to um, the changing terrain and changing social practices um, of which media and communication uh, use and media and communication tools a big component, a big part. And most forms of surveillance, especially at the everyday level, involve the use of personalized technologies and applications and are driven by a variety of social practices, such as online social networking. And with that comes various forms of surveillance and social control, one of which has to do with these social networking sites using information in a variety of ways, some of which the users are aware of, some of which are not. And some of you might be familiar with some uh, civic action against, against Facebook, especially starting from 2007, um, against the company using private information entered by its users. And if you read the terms of uh, privacy on Facebook, they are allowed to, once you become a member there, they're allowed to use our information and sell it to certain companies in the, in the United States. And there are lo lots of other practices they, that they um, engage in in relation to user um, information. And also these uh, applications and these modes of socialization and mediation are quickly, widely, and willingly adopted um, 
by individuals and it necessitates involvement and commitment on the part of the individuals. And that's why we call this new phase of surveillance, complicit surveillance. In other words, it is very difficult to uh, differentiate where it starts and where it ends. A lot of the times these practices and applications are very much interconnected, although the lines and the borders and boundaries are not immediately visible. But it also requires uh, partaking on the part of the users and individuals, producing a variety of uh, consequences and results and, and social contingencies. So what we're seeing here is the rise of mediated social surveillance and its growing prominence in many aspects of everyday life. And we identify uh, two interlinked aspects in relation to this new uh, phase or new phase of surveillance. The ways in which a complicit surveillance logic marks the meta process of mediatization. And here, where I'm coming from is that late modernity is very much marked by a number of meta processes like globalization and mediatization. And Krotz, Frederick Krotz, for example, talks about these processes, these meta processes, and he differentiates between processes and meta processes as open-ended, long-term processes, some of the consequences of which are immediately visible and they are imminent, some of which are open-ended and it, you know, it takes a longer time to see what happens with that. So mediatization is one of those meta processes, obviously, that mark late modernity, such as globalization, also individualization. And since media use and mediatization and everyday mediations are very much enmeshed, interlinked with surveillance practices, which I very briefly try to summarize here and give examples. Therefore, we can say that a complicit surveillance logic marks mediatization, this meta process. So it's very much there. And if you look at the individual subjective everyday level, the forms of this logic manifest itself at the social and, and individual subjective levels, such as intervalence. And what we are talking about with intervalence is, for example, peer-to-peer -peer surveillance. And I will say more about that in a minute. Therefore, surveillance here is both ubiquitously apply, implied at the macro abstract level and utilized as a tool of sociality at the everyday um, individual level of self-realization or social practice. And of course, especially when we talk about this changing uh, notion of or meanings of or practices of surveillance at the everyday individual level, we are de facto talking about uh, the notion of privacy and new formations of new understandings of privacy or new practices of uh, preserving or making available private information. And based on the interviews we conducted as part of these projects, um, I can say that what we found was that privacy and the exchange of private information, especially through these online social media sites, emerges something to be displayed, made available, or restricted, modulated in establishing hierarchies of intimacy and power. In other words, especially with the younger um, individuals we interviewed for this study, from all segments of um, the society, as I summed up earlier, um, we saw that they, they do not regard privacy and private information, especially using these online social media sites, as not necessarily as something to be protected but they modulate it and they use it in, in, in a variety of ways, as I said, to establish hierarchies of intimacy and power within their social networks toward various ends. So the domain of private information is not understood, uh, it's not socially understood as something to be protected or fought for, but something to be skillfully managed and used toward personal and social ends. And we see um, different exposures of privacy and private information, especially, again, giving social media uh, sites as an example. We see personal enclaves in public domains, if you use such metaphors, uh, for example, the wall uh, application on Facebook. Um, we see more in-group places for making information and communication available. So we see different degrees of making available privacy and private information. And we see also desire to monitor and 
the ways in which I use desire as a concept here is in reference to Deleuze. He talks about, um, when he talks about Foucault and Foucault's notion of uh, surveillance and discipline, he says in an in a article called uh, Postscript on Societies of Control, we see a switch in late modernity from societies of discipline to societies of control. And it says, pain and pleasure, which is used as a punishment or reward in, in the Foucaultian understanding of discipline and surveillance, we see, he says we see desire is replacing that. So conceptually, theoretically speaking, if you try to um, understand the findings of, of the study uh, in relation to um, the use of private information, especially if you try to conceptualize that, we can say that we see um, three levels or three, three modes of uh, monitoring. One is watching others in the civic and personal realm, which is moral as well as voyeuristic. The second is watching others, watching ourselves. Again, if you think about Facebook and similar applications, it's, it's, more, uh, it's easier to understand. And experiencing their gazes, which is ultimately a narcissistic desire. And the third one is watching our own data doubles the hypermediate itself. Just to read some quotes from the interviews to sort of give more flesh, uh, to make more concrete what I'm trying to talk about here. Most of the informants express, express preferences, um, and this was based on different criteria, of course, toward modulating who in their circle sees their private information and to what extent, rather than considering total withdrawal of personal data which is pretty much de facto impossible, especially if you're using um, online social media applications. For example, we asked um, each and every person we interviewed, what does privacy mean to you? And here's one example from um, a male um, in his 30s. He said, that I as an individual have control over, well, that I have a sense of control over what, what people know about me, about my private life. So it's sort of like I have a private sphere in a public sphere and some facts about me can be accessible publicly. And I guess I usually know what depth of information is available about me in public. And whatever is not available is in my private sphere. And I have to be careful in certain contexts about what people know about me. I'm a member of a Turkish association, for example, and there people can be very curious. They ask questions about you and talk, talk, to, talk to each other about you. So he was very carefully using his information to um, present himself or to perform himself in, in various different social um, circles. And this is another um, informant, again, a male in his 30s. How do you feel about privacy and surveillance on social networking sites? I heard a discussion about it a year and a half ago in Sweden. That's when I became aware of it. But I must say, I must say that, I'm not that I'm not that knowledgeable about the terms and conditions. I haven't read them properly. <coughs> Sorry, I must say that if they use it, that is private data, for commercial purposes, then I guess I'm okay with it. And this is something we saw a lot actually with younger, especially younger uh, users. But I mean, if it has my name on it, if they use my name, then it's a different matter. So we're seeing very interesting approaches to or understandings of privacy and private information and what these individuals con consider as surveillance and social control. So the complicity in question here, what we refer to as complicit surveillance, is in referring to the agentic character of current modes of surveillance, that the individuals willingly or unwillingly, knowingly or un unknowingly um, commit to or get engaged in. And in this study, most of the individuals, um, and a lot of them were long-time savvy users, had little to none um, awareness of the pervasiveness of surveillance on social networking sites and commodification of private data. This, of course, is not to criticize them, but this is just one of the findings of the study. But interestingly, they were quite critical of more visible forms of surveillance. And a lot of them actually pointed that out, that if they see a camera, they, they find that problematic. One of them, for example, says, I'm not a Luddite, but I don't buy the arguments put forth by politicians to promote applications like security cameras. There was a talk about that in Sweden to uh, put security cameras after a bombing, just like the ones in the United Kingdom in, in the public sphere, in, in public places. 
and he said, I believe they should not be used. And we got similar responses from a majority of the users we um, interviewed. Cameras were very much seen as, as associated with um, surveillance and social control or a more top-down mode of um, controlling and surveilling. But the same is not true for uh, mediated communication, especially using new technologies and online and mobile technologies. Another one said, I lived in London and there are CCTV, CCTV cameras everywhere. Actually, the fact that there are cameras everywhere makes you feel that there's a security issue. When there are no cameras, it implies that you live in a safe and secure society and that surveillance is not needed. The same individual also pointed out that as long as this is the same individual who said, if it's used for, if my information is used for commercial purposes, I don't care that much, but if my name is attached to it, then it's another um, issue. And this is the same informant who finds cameras um, as a surveillance tool or social control tool very problematic. So that's, that's very interesting, I think, in terms of the ways in which individuals regard different uh, forms or formats of uh, media and, and control and surveillance vis-a-vis -vis each other. <clears throat> and the attitudes towards horizontal visibility, that is, individuals, for example, again, to give um, online social networking sites such as Facebook as an example, the horizontal visibility, that is, peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, visibility, and monitoring online range between indifference and knowing approval amongst the informants. Um, and we can say especially also looking at the quantitative data we acquired through the national survey, it confirms the same result that older informants are more worried about privacy online. Um, and we also see, again conceptually speaking, the mediated deployment of various sets of private and digital data is a symbolic pursuit is a tactic commonly used by younger people to both offset borders, and I saw this especially in relation to the migrant um, individuals living in, in, in the Stockholm area. And that's why um, it is important to consider city space and urban space and their physical living environments in relation to their um, social practice and media practice. Because it happens to be the case that um, especially Turkish migrants living in, in the urban areas in, in, in Sweden, in Stockholm, they Stockholm is a very segregated city. Almost all immigrants live outside the city in, in suburban areas. And in the case of the Turkish migrants, they concentrate in certain neighborhoods based on, which is most uh, commonly the case, based on where they um, came from, Turkey, for example. There's a big group of people who came from Kulu, and they live in certain areas in Stockholm in close proximity to each other. And there are other groups, again, concentrating in, in certain areas outside the city, living in close proximity. So what I found when I interviewed these, um, especially the younger individuals um, living in those areas with Turkish migrant backgrounds, was that in some ways, mediated communication and online social media were seen as um, alternatives to social control and monitoring that they experience offline, that is, in, in physical terms, in the communities they live. But also, of course, this doesn't offset the fact that there is monitoring and social control, control online as well. So what I found was that they, um, they um, use this as a tactic uh, to offset borders and avoid exclusion, both online and offline, and to create, to use board use terms, wittingly or unwittingly, new enclosures and territories. This necessarily leads to um, the creation, as well as it can be emancipating in some contexts, it also creates new borders, new territories, or new enclosures. And of course, the exclusion of others who are not uh, partaking in, in such new or novel um, social platforms, which are made available through um, online social media. So in sum, we can say that ontologies and geographies of interconnection, uh, for example, cosmopolitan positionings and encapsulation can be accurately, uh, these dual dynamics captured from a mediatization framework that is looking at mediatization as one of the uh, logics of uh, late modernity. And by placing mediatization alongside the other meta processes such as globalization and also taking into consideration other social, cultural, um, political factors. <clears throat>
So this is, in a nutshell, what we found in the study and what we're referring to as completed surveillance and intervalence in relation to mediatization. Um, the second paper I talked about, online mediations in transnational spaces, cosmopolitan formations of belonging and identity in the Turkish diaspora. And this is also associated with the project, the product of the project. And in this one, I was specifically looking at uh, the migrant communities living in Stockholm, again, with Turkish Kurdish backgrounds. Uh, and within that, speci especially um, women and their use of media technologies and in relation to these openings and closures that are created due to increased pervasiveness of media and communication technologies. And in this one, although I'm not talking about uh, surveillance per se um, explicitly, it is of course very much uh, one of the tropes that, that runs through the study in the background. So in this one, I was looking at expressions of identity and belonging at the intersection of online communicative practice and offline spatial formations. As I said, their living conditions in the physical world, in the city, uh, the kinds of uh, dynamics or openings and closures that creates and on top of that, how they use uh, media and communication technologies and to what ends. And what can we say about belonging and pursuits of identity considering all these factors, especially in relation to the women, the younger women um, who are living in these migrant contexts. And one interesting, um, both a starting point and the result of that study was the persistence and reinvention of meanings of place as a determining factor in identity formation, especially through media use. Um, in what came to be labeled as internet studies, again, in, especially in the 1990s and early 2000s, we saw a lot of talk about deterritorialization due to globalization and increased use of uh, media and communication technologies. That is physical territory or space losing its uh, meaning or prominence and the fact that we are living in a deterritorialized uh, virtual realm. What I found in this study was that place was not disappearing in its importance or significance but it was being reappropriated or reinvented with new meanings being attached to it. And it was very much still a significant factor in relation to media use. And I will talk more about it as I go along. And the discussion in this paper focuses on um, online me social media in the case of people of Turkish origin living in the Stockholm area. And I'm seeking, I'm trying to demonstrate how these media do not necessarily detach identities from place, but rather relocate them in it. So place and space remain important factors. And in doing so, um, the aim here is to offer a more nuanced celebration of locality and translocality and fixity and transcultural fluidity uh, in a more um, realistic, so to speak, um, term. And based on an empirical study. And I use mediation as a conceptual tool here, and given the past trajectory of the term, it could be used to highlight specific instances and sites of the interplay between socio-cultural, political, and spatial processes, and extensive media penetration in transforming each other, especially if you look at online mediations. And such interplay is highly complex, unlike what some of the studies, again, at the height of uh, new media and online media uh, sought to demonstrate, the interplay is highly complex. It produces both change and continuity and fixity. And it does engender moments of unforeseen change and sites of unexpected continuity. And the interviews for this study revealed with consistency certain patterns of mediation. There were strong, strong sentiments about the close connections between space and place, feelings of both alienation and association with the host and home cultures that shape routines and consequently borders of identity as these individuals um, engage with it. And in the study, in the first part, I uh, framed the discussion in terms of transnationalism as a broader, uh, larger framework and cosmopolitanism as an analytical tool to see how these individuals position themselves. Um, in, the use of, uh, in relation to the use of media technology in these contexts. And in the second part, I try to um, empirically locate um, the intersectionality between online space 
offline lo locality and territoriality, and communicative sociality and gender. And again, this calls into question earlier conceptualizations of online space as placeless space. And as I will give examples, it happened to be the case that place um, and attachment to place was a very significant factor. A lot of the people, a lot of these women I interviewed had close, um, very strong sentiments about living in Stockholm. And a lot of the times they expressed that they would not consider living elsewhere in Sweden, but only in Stockholm. So there's a very interesting complex dynamic at play there. Stockholm happens to be a very segregated city, but we also see both feelings of alienation because of that segregation, um, based on the interviews with these individuals, but we also see efforts to reinvent or produce new meanings of Stockholm based on their own positionings. And in the third part, I offer some reflections on the notions of mobility, agency, and expressivity, especially in relation to the ways in which these notions are embodied in the communication process in the lives of these individuals. And to give some um, highlights or bullet points based on the findings, you could say that there's a complex variety of elements that underlie everyday migrant existence and mind frame, <coughs> mind frame uh, that I found in this study. And it is um, similar to some other findings that are found in, in studies on, for example, Turkish migrants in, in Germany. And within this group, of course, it's uh, impossible to generalize because it's a, still a limited empirical study. But what I found was that there was a sharp perception of the current global and national conjuncture and of the existence of both diversity and cultural fusion. So there was very um, much self-reflexivity. An awareness and willingness to accept and negotiate, to use Beck's terms, relativity of one's own social position and culture. An equally sharp awareness of the different positionalities and others within. And it happens to be the case that in this migrant group, Turkish migrant group, there were a lot of tensions between uh, different groups that belong to the same uh, larger Turkish migrant group, depending on where they come from, their politics, etc. There were a lot of uh, divisions as well, and a lot of social tension between different groups. <clears throat> There's also a pragmatist mentality to mobilize group identities for recognition and privilege in the larger Swedish society, of course, that we commonly see with migrant communities. A critical self-aware attitude toward cultural favoritism of the West that is favoring some others such as Christians or Eastern European migrants over Muslim others. And this was noted by quite a few of the um, informants, especially uh, the females ones which were the subjects in this study. And um, they, even though they may or may not be uh, positioned based on their religious identity, oftentimes they expressed that they were sort of put into that category or perceived as such because of where, where they come from. And they oftentimes um, offered very self-reflexive comments as to how they see themselves as positioned by the larger Swedish society vis-a-vis -vis other migrant groups also living there. Now I saw a constant, constant contestation between simultaneously universalistic and particularistic values um, that is regard for human rights and need to preserve uh, language and culture and also exclu exclusive groupism such as persistence of traditions, arranged marriages, the favor, uh, uh, the attitude that favors the community over the individual. So they, they exist and live with uh, such complex and intertwined dynamics. So as revealed through the interviews, if we try to sort of uh, put the findings in more general terms with this uh, group of migrants living in, uh, in, in, in the Stockholm area, on the one hand, we see a general encompassing element of commonality, of identity, and identification with a share, shared historicity, language, and everyday culture within this group. But on the other hand, we also see a great deal of diversity and pronounced elements of generational gender and class differences and antagonisms arising from both territorial and class origins of certain subgroups. And as it was pointed out by some other uh, researchers, such as Weston and Anderson, a lot of the time studies on um, Turkish groups or Kurdish groups living in, in, in Sweden um, do so based on notions or positionings related with religion, although quite a few of these individuals happen to be secular. <clears throat> 
So in some ways, both in terms of the ways in which they are portrayed or represented in, in, in the media, in mainstream everyday media, and also to a certain extent in academic research, oftentimes the commonalities are pronounced, but the differences within the same group are sort of um, undermined or not highlighted as, as much. But there is obviously, there is um, commonality as much as diversity within this group. And there are differences between the ways in which they um, engage with mediation and media use in relation to political positioning and identity pursuits. A number of the participants that I interviewed indicated that they feel in certain social instances, especially a strong alienation from the society as a result of popular perceptions about their origin, appearance, and cultural backgrounds. And a number of the female participants said that they felt native Swedes displayed prejudice or in some cases mere naivete against females of certain ethnic origin. One university student remarked, I can see it in their native eyes that when they look at me, they think, oh, another one of those Svartskale. And Svartskale is a very derogatory Swedish term, literally meaning uh, black skull, which is used to denote their dark hair color. And they get shocked when they hear my native Swedish accent. I'm Turkish educated and non veiled They don't know what to make of me. And I s heard uh, similar remarks with these younger females that I interviewed for, for this study. They were very much self-aware and, and self-reflexive about these positionings. So their physical location in the city and the degree to which they interact with the larger society very much play into their mediation habits and the virtual channels they prioritize for everyday socialization. And that's why we try to um, underlie the importance of looking at these factors before we try to understand um, how they engage with media use and mediation in relation to politics and identity and civic presence and civic participation. Because the ways in which they are positioned physically in, in, in the urban space in the social space, in the social arena is very much a factor and that creates a lot of differences between different groups and different individuals. And in the interviews, I did not start the study by prioritizing or looking at online social media, but I sort of used or utilized the ground of theory approach and I let the individuals or the participants speak for themselves, speak for themselves. And a lot of the times uh, in these interviews, online social media were consistently pointed to um, by the informants as platforms where communication assumes a more expressive form. And this, again, is not to suggest that it's an alternative to um, the physical space or offline communication, but it does afford uh, or make possible different modes of communication where belonging and connection are sought outside the bounds of more commonplace versions of ethnic identity that is readily attributed to migrants and the intersections of online and offline sociality. There are certain representative uh, institutions and organizations that represent these migrant groups in, in, in Sweden. And these younger individuals expressed that when they become members of that, that gives you a different kind of visibility and you get involved in circles that you do not necessarily wish to identify with or belong to. And in that way, although again, the online uh, pursuit is not an alternative, it does still accommodate different forms of socialization and identification, um, which is not necessarily available offline and through these actual um, organizations and representative institutions. And we can say these platforms are places also where the cultural and the political are intertwined, leading to the rise of new sensibilities and new communities of choice in a particular form of social sphere where mediation plays a significant role. And, and I, as I did the study, um, the Facebook groups um, that were referred to as meeting places by these individuals were um, Isvetli Turkler, Swedish Turks, Isvetli Turkleri, Turks of Sweden. And I was uh, made aware that these two were rivals to each other. And Turkari Stockholm, Turks in Stockholm, Isvetli Eshiyan Turkler, Turks living in Sweden, Isvetli is we are in Sweden. And this was uh, moderated by the offline Sweden ID and Culture Association. And another was a group for the Swedish Turk and there were a bunch of others. And some of these disappeared now, and there are some other ones. But what we're seeing here is a very dynamic um, effort 
to create new forms or new modes of identification and, and social gathering, social platforms using uh, the online platforms. And we also see uh, Sweden and Stockholm, that is space and place, are still very much part of that effort, that pursuit in the online domain as well. So we can say that in some ways, on the one hand, constraint and fixity that are rooted in both demographic and spatial factors because of the ways in which, as I said, they're positioned in the city, uh, such as segregation, are dynamically challenged from within by subverting and symbolically reinventing the very con containers of closure, such as place. That is, reinventing the meaning attached to Stockholm as a city. And that's very interesting. And by generating altered spaces of belonging open to new relational experiences. So mediation and the role of online spaces here, we can say, is in terms of their accommodating diverse forms of togetherness and voice, even if not necessarily civic practice or citizenship practices, um, and extended possibilities to see the world from a variety of others' perspectives. So we can say that on the one hand, it allows for a more sort of cos cosmopolitan positioning. And again, further to that, in relation to mediation, we can say that mediation as a tool emerges both as a practical resource for communicating, community building on a day-to-day -day basis or for managing other, other sorts of uh, business and pursuit, and also as a symbolic means for placemaking and status building vis-a-vis -vis alongside the other dynamics that are happening offline in the real actual social space. And on the one hand, while we can see um, increased mediation and penetration of uh, media and communication tools, especially in social contexts where there is constraint and fixity, such as migrant contexts, such as the one I'm talking about, is positively contributing to the diasporic communicative space, we should also not forget, of course, that it operates as a divisive force by way of creating digital enclosures, forms of encapsulation, and further social stratification. That is, excluding ones or individuals or groups or voices that are not existing or who are not able to partake in these new um, platforms. And finally, thinking mobility agency and gender together, um, gender dynamics are also, of course, very important to take into consideration as we're trying to understand these pursuits and efforts in, in, in such contexts. <clears throat> and they are generative of stratification, stratification such as just like class, you know, various forms of specialities and positionalities. And I take mobility here in its broadest sense, both actual and imaginative, and uh, reflexivity as dual forces navigating um, individual dispositions and expressivity offering um, as offering an analytical gateway to approaching gendered cosmopolitan subjectivities. And another finding that was prominent as a result of this study was that in addition to reinforcing existing and engendering new spaces of belonging, online groups, especially in the case of these individuals, uh, female women um, uh, members of this diasporic group that I interviewed, it also allows for um, enactments of what we can call phantasmic belonging, especially for individuals who do not wish to um, subscribe to identificatory categories or who do not wish to subscribe in literal terms to certain categories or certain identifications or certain um, groups of uh, representative <coughs> institutions by way of becoming active or visible uh, members but who want to partake both for ontological security and for simple sociality. A lot of the times these individuals were pointing out the fact that they are using online social media and such groups that I talked about earlier the social groups like Turks in Stockholm, etc., not necessarily to find new people or people who do not, they do not know, but just to find like-minded people in where they live, in the city they live, and to create alternative groupings and social platforms, which again is not necessarily possible through other offline formations and social platforms. So, as such, online social media platforms not only facilitate ordinary networking of individuals and groups, but also pursuing regimes of invisibility and concealment 
And of course, someone who studies surveillance, I'm well aware that invisibility is pretty much um, impossible in the online domain. But the invisibility that I'm talking about here is um, the ability or uh, the affordance that is granted by media technologies that, is, that allows for utilization of um, self-expressivity and private information in novel, um, innovative ways that, is otherwise, that otherwise might not be possible. But otherwise, of course, everything online is, is very much visible. And individuals incorporate various communicative tactics <clears throat> to avoid power geometries and social monitoring. But of course, in many ways, they enter into new platforms, new domains, where there are other forms of social monitoring and social control and surveillance. So what we can say based on this study um, is that due to increased mediation and penetration of these technologies and the ways in which these individuals are positioned um, in, in the real uh, realm, in, in the real domain, we see ease at continuously crossing social borders, but at the same time creation of uh, new borders, sometimes tighter borders. We see a disposition toward appropriating simultaneously local particularistic and savvy universalistic sensibilities. So we can very much say that cosmopolitan positionings and closure are very much dual dynamics operating at the same time. Allowing for um, walking into or venturing into new terrains, making uh, connections, more inner connections, but at the same time uh, limiting in, 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 in different ways. And we see vis-a-vis -vis these dynamics an accompanying tactic to carve out and carve out social and personal space at the juncture of online physical space and mediated communication. And these intersectional communicative spaces engender specific experiences of belonging and rejection of it in, in some cases, empathy and distrust, and to use Roger Silverstone's words, which does without the consolation of idealized images of community and communication. So what this study taught me um, as a researcher, although, of course, the study, again, is limited in, in its scope, and it's, it's part of an ongoing project, was that the dynamics that exist within these groups is very complex and not necessarily uh, visible to the eye unless we sort of zoom in and look at particular practices based on particular individuals taking on board the particular positionings these individuals bring. Uh, as they engage in media and communication practices. And in our efforts as researchers to think about these pursuits in relation to identity and, and politics. So I think I can just cut it here. Uh, I tried to summarize the findings in a nutshell and perhaps if you have any <coughs> questions and comments we can take it, take it from there. <coughs>